don't get to lie down? What's it like a therapeutic? If you uh, want to lie down and tell me what's struggling you. It all started with. <laughs> <laughs> it's all started with residency. <laughs> how you doing, my man? Good, good. Look how far away you are from me. All right. All right. There you go. All right. <laughs> Look how close you are to me. All right. All right. Let's go ahead. We're going to ask you some trauma questions. You are, in my opinion, one of the premier trauma EM people. You speak at conferences. You're recognized on social media as one of those people. So people must be asking you some pretty wild questions about how do you do this and that. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I feel privilege to have that knowledge to share. So I'm happy to answer any questions about fighting dogma, really. It's stuff that we've been really trained through ATLS and that kind of thing that perhaps isn't quite the thing that you should be doing with your trauma patients. Sounds like we should do some dogma lysis. Yeah. We're doing over here. Let's okay, go. Cool. And so we'll also take some questions from the audience. So please think of some questions that you might have. But these are some questions that I collected uh, before we started our session that I think will resonate with people. So you see a patient who comes in traumatic arrest. We'll just say this is somebody who has a, a GSW somewhere enters the box and they're coming in in arrest and chest compression is happening. What's your thought on the management of traumatic arrest? Should it be ACLS? Should it be ATLS? Or should it be something different altogether when they arrive to you in the trauma bay? Yeah, it's a great question, right? So Chest compression, somebody who's arrested, chest compressions we know in medical arrest is the thing to do, right? It's clearly shown by the evidence to be useful. But let's think about what happens in a medical arrest versus a trauma arrest. So medical arrest, probably maybe they had an MI or something, their pump fails. That's not what happens in a true traumatic arrest, right? So there's either one or two things that are happening. Either they bled to death, so the pump has nothing to pump or there's some sort of tension physiology like a tamponade or a tension pneumothorax. And so the pump's working fine, but it's got an obstruction to flow. And pushing on the chest doesn't help any of those scenarios. In fact, it can delay the life-saving intervention that you wanna do. You get looking at your friend and you say, move or I will cut you. And, and that's what happens real. because you have to relieve the tension or do a uh, thoracotomy or whatever it is, and you can't do that if your buddies on the chest pump in for no good reason. What about the fact that it makes them feel better that they're doing something? That's great, but like the patient's dead. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> so what's your sequence of procedures that you do when you have that person traumatic arrest? Yeah, it's a great question. So usually I try to follow what's called, some people have written this out like a hot algorithm. So address things that you can immediately reverse. So is there any external hemorrhage? Control that oxygenation, so get a tube down or put an LMA down or bag valve mask. Tension and tamponade are the next things. You can use your ultrasound quickly to identify one of those things. You can do bilateral finger thoracostomies prophylactically, or if you have the skills, you can proceed to a thoracotomy if that's needed. And then the next T is to replace the volume transfuse, so give them blood. And that's the general principles that I'm going to follow of events has happened at that point, do you think it's reasonable then to start getting back on the chest because you've covered, relieved all the obstruction, there's nothing else to do except continue cardiac perfusion? Yeah, if the chest is still closed, then I think it's reasonable at that point. Once you've addressed any life threats uh, that are clearly related to the trauma, I think you can proceed with that. And remember, one caveat is we have, we've all seen this, the person who has like an MI and crashes their car. So if you're clear that you've excluded those kind of other issues, then continue and mix up your trauma and medical resuscitation because that's the underlying problem. Definitely get through that algorithm, take yeah. all of those obstructive causes yeah. and the hemorrhagic shock off the table before you just make yourself feel better and your team feel right, better. Right, exactly. Yeah, you can high five each other later. It's even better if you get ROSC. Fantastic. All right, so people will often say that in trauma, when you have hypotension, the best basal pressure is blood, right? And Tongue in cheek and ho ho ho, the best phase of work. Yeah, I get it. But not everyone works in a center like yours, because I heard what happens in your center is that the angels come down from the trombe and deliver you a massive transfusion <laughs> protocol every time. Not everyone works in that center, man. So we are the angels. <laughs> we are the angels. So my question to you is for centers that don't have blood as accessible in the trauma bay, is there ever any circumstance with the person who's acutely hypotensive to use vasopressors 
for the management of hypotension. And you've touched a raw nerve right there. It's Go a, for it. Right so this has been a question that's been asked for years, right? Because we've looked at this in other forms of shock, sepsis, et cetera. Then clearly vasopressors have a benefit of there. When applied early, we've had a bunch of talks already about that. But so similarly, the trauma community looked at this, whether it was useful to get it. And they did a bunch of studies looking at whether they give epinephrine, norepinephrine to a person who's hypovolemic, or even after they fill the tank with volume. And in all those studies, they showed actually worse outcomes in the patients that got vasoactive medications. But the, to understand why that is, you have to delve into how end-stage hemorrhagic shock works. So when this person is about to die, what we always think about for hemorrhagic shock is that it's vasoconstrictive shock. But actually, towards the end of it, it becomes vasodilatory. And the reason is that there's actually a number of mechanisms that kind of affect the receptors that can attach norepinephrine or epinephrine molecules and actually downregulate them. So even though there's a high volume it, from your fight or flight response of adrenaline and norepinephrine in your body, there's not enough receptors to get them into the cell. And when you give externally even more, then they're just fighting for a small number of receptors. But there's one agent or one presser that is actually in deficiency in vasodilatory states, and that's vasopressin. And so there is some evolving evidence that shows both animal and human trials that have shown the benefit of utilizing vasopressin in early resuscitation for hemorrhagic shock. And there still probably needs to be a little bit more work on it. But if you're going to give a vasoactive medication, think about giving vasopressin. Maybe a stupid question, but is it a dose that you give? Do you titrate it up? Do you titrate it down? Or is it the 0.03? Yeah, so it's interesting. So they, the studies that have looked at it give a bolus dose of about 40 units like from the get-go and then start a drip. And that could be institutional dependent 0.03, 0.04. But then they continue that drip, but it's that bolus that they give first and then move on to the drip. Okay. And I didn't want you to think of me as an idiot, but I'm going to ask the question. So it is what it is. Crystalloids for patients. So you have that person, you're waiting for blood is going to be 30 minutes say no more. I'm done. All right. <laughs> having said that, no. So having said that, so we know that the person's bleeding out. You should give them back what they're bleeding. But there was a really cool recent paper that said sometimes you just don't have immediate access to blood. So what do you do? Just look at them until that blood comes. And they said that probably if you give like up to 500 cc's of crystalloid, that's okay. But don't flood them like we used to do. That's great. And that's what I'm getting at. We always talk at these conferences, these high-end things about the things that you must do for your patients. And then you go back to your shift in the real world yeah. where you can't instantly have that. Exactly. So exactly. that's good to know. Yeah. No more than 500 cc's yeah. of crystalloid. Does it matter NS or LR? Are we splitting I, hairs like that? Maybe, but ideally LR, it's more physiological. We've seen that benefit in critical care literature. So go with that one. Such a surgeon answer. To uh. LR. Okay, good. <laughs> The lethal diamond, right? Yeah. We're not talking about the lethal trimond. The yeah. lethal, and that's hypocalcemia. Yeah. So give me an idea of when we should empirically give calcium. I always see it as an afterthought. Yeah. I've given them massive transfusion. Oh, yeah, we should give calcium. Yeah. Where's your marker where in your algorithm, so you never forget to give calcium, where do you put that? Yeah, great question. So we actually going back to that pathophysiology of end-stage hemorrhagic shock, the, one of the mechanisms that also prevents vasoconstriction of the vessels is a deficiency of calcium. And so interestingly, they've done a few studies that have shown that just over half of patients may be hypocalcemic on arrival after they've been critically injured. And certainly thinking about giving calcium even earlier before you've even given blood can be something to think about. And that can help with the response, the body's response to the, the hemorrhage and actually feeds into all those other things in the traditional diamond that we, traditional triangle that we talk about with the hypothermia and the acidosis, et cetera, and actually helps uh, modulate all those uh, factors too. But there's a caveat. So you shouldn't just give blanket calcium to everybody. Giving too much calcium can actually be detrimental to your patients, uh, as is hypocalcemia as well. So they're both uh, affecting mortality. So really, you want that Goldilocks patient. So if you have access to a point of care testing, say you do a blood gas real quick, you can get an eye count on that, then give it. But if the patient's in arrest, then giving the calcium early with your other resuscitation products, I think that's okay to do. Now, again, I know you work in this magical place where the IV tubing comes from the ceiling, and it's just the right amount of calcium to the patient every <laughs> single time. 
<laughs> but in places that don't have that, what would you say an empiric dose of calcium would be that you would give just to say, at least I've taken hypocalcium off the table and then after multiple units of the blood with all the chelating agents. So do you have just like the, the least amount of calcium that you would give to feel good about so you don't go overboard? I usually give two grams. Two grams up yeah. front? Yeah. And then do you give two grams after a mess? And then after, yeah. So after four units of like product or component product, then you might give another uh, gram or gram to two grams after that, depending on the iCal. By that time, usually you have access to kind of lab work. Gotcha. And your hospital's not going to be upset that you gave away the secret formula of what comes out of the ceiling. Uh, no? You're good? This is our secret. All right, great. What happens in Philly stays in Philly. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> TXA, is it really much of a deb debate anymore? Oh, dude, you still there. So there's this been huge worldwide trial that shows that TXA is great. And for some reason in America, people are like, ah, it's terrible. And they're still debating. They're still talking about it. Um, but there's clear benefit now in multiple trials that says for really sick trauma patients, you give it within three hours, there's benefit. Even if they have brain injuries or not, which was one of the concerns before, but actually giving that early works. So beyond the three hours, don't give it. The risk-benefit ratio kind of flips. But the sooner you give it, the better. And then is there much of a debate about the dose? I'm starting to see people do, I like to use one gram. I like to use two grams. What is the best evidence that we have for how to bolus people? Yeah, it's a great question. So traditionally, we've moved, we've given like a gram bolus and then a gram over eight hours. That's what most places will do. But there's been a few papers that have looked at this. There's a great paper, the STAMP trial that came out of um, Pittsburgh primarily. It was a pre-hospital trial. They looked at different dosing regimens and they said actually in the sickest patients, actually giving two gram bolus up front is the better way uh, to do it. And those, that group of patients actually did much better down the line. And if you think about it, logistically, it's actually pretty easy to do. If your pre-hospital teams are giving it, they can administer just the two gram bolus real quick. In the hospital, you can give it in the trauma bay so that anesthesia doesn't have to worry about it later when they're up in the operating room. Uh, so I think if you're implementing TXA in your place, give it early and give two grams. If you're giving the two gram dose in those trials, are there any adverse effects versus the one gram bolus? Yeah, uh, so potentially there is a risk with TXA in general of increased uh, venous thromboembolism. But my take is I can deal with a complication in an alive patient. Trying to revive dead is like much more difficult. That's a big complication, <laughs> dead. Yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. All right, Zap, thank you very much. Yeah. We'll take some uh, questions from the audience. We could take one or two. All right. Hey, Zav, thanks for uh, doing this presentation and doing this like with us. I had a question in regards of uh, RSI in trauma uh, about using full dose or half dose reduction doses in our trauma patients. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, great question. RSI in trauma, I think, has been uh, a little bit late to the game uh, in the resuscitation, resuscitate before you intubate thing. But I think over the last five, six years, there's been much more emphasis on that. So first and foremost, certainly think about resuscitating beforehand. So hypotensive trauma patient, if you tube them, without a restoring volume, they're gonna die once you induce them, even if you're like the most expert person in the room doing that, because they need the volume before you transition them to positive pressure ventilation. And so control any external bleeding, give them volume, and then proceed with your intubation. Interestingly, when we've changed that approach, sometimes they start perfusing their brain and you realize actually they don't need to be tubed anyway. So let's say they, you need to go ahead and tube them, I like to look at the shock index. So I look at the shock index and I see whether these patients are hypotensive or not. I use 0.9 as my kind of threshold. And so if they're really sick, really hypotensive, I will half my induction dose. And sometimes I'll go even lower. And it was interesting when I was down in Baltimore, we used to watch the anesthesiologists do, and they used to use propofol of all drugs. So I goes, what? what the hell, man? Propofol for a trauma patient who's hypotensive already? but they would give 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams, so really tiny doses, and that's really the key. Definitely, I would say stick to the relatively cardio-stable agents, but go half, go lower even with those really sick hypotensive patients because that inevitably, even those cardio-stable drugs can cause vasodilation when given in shock patients. One more question. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Kasson, you said that there was a, study out of that other city. Are you allowed to say that other city's name while you're here? Only if you don't add Steelers to it. Okay, I just want to check. 
<laughs> but my real question, is there a role for pericardiocentesis in the patient with trauma who has either an effusion or tamponade? Or should we just be open in the chest? Yeah, it's an interesting question because you always get taught that there's if you do a pericardiocentesis, there's like a clot at both ends of the needle, right? But I would say try and... So say your typical emergency medicine physician who graduates and goes into a career in community medicine or whatever, even in the working in the trauma center, the likelihood that they will end up having to do a thoracotomy maybe once, twice in their career. And so maintaining that skill and knowing what to do when, and actually the inertia of actually progressing to this procedure might be real challenging to them. On the other hand, especially with ultrasound and stuff, it might just be easier to try and get aspirate that blood with a needle. And so if that's what you're comfortable with and the patient has no other choice, I'd say go ahead and try it. You might even, and even relieving small volume of fluid from around the heart can get it beating again. Is give it a shot. It might work. And you've then, within your skill set and within your resources, are able to help that patient. I wouldn't take it off the table. All right. So let's give Zap a big round of applause for sharing his expertise. Thanks, man. <laughs>